thanks for listening to the first part. I think there's a few of us that will be coming back now. Um, so before I open the floor up to questions, which I will, and then explain a little bit about how I think we can get ourselves out of this terrible pickle, I want to give you an idea, okay? Um, and it's based on two particular things. I mentioned earlier on the words pedagogy and andragogy. Now, those of us that are teachers, or those who've dealt in andragogy education, will be very familiar with what those words mean. Pedagogy is the teaching of children, and andragogy is the teaching of adults. They are two separate disciplines. Um, and they, they, they interact in very many different ways, but they're not the same thing at all. So I'm going to introduce you to a third one. Um, and I'm not going to tell you what it is yet until I've told you a story. Consider the following. If we go back far enough, pre the Enlightenment, the priests controlled the knowledge. Mostly because yeah. what was written was written in Latin. Yeah. Yep. And they wouldn't tell people what it said. They just sent out edicts based on their interpretation of what the knowledge was at the time. At that point in history, knowledge was power. Right? Knowledge was power. Then along came this chap called Gutenberg. A few of you may have heard of him. And he invented what became known as the Gutenberg Press, which meant for the first time that humanity could begin what was an incredibly long journey from an ignorant populace to an educated populace. That took years and lots of fighting, and many people died for us to have the ability to read what the Gutenberg Press meant could be printed for us to engage with. That was a revolution. That began the Enlightenment, really. That began the process that's got us to where we are, that we can turn up on a Sunday and sit in a warm room and listen to me yammer while I'm being filmed, which would eventually go on a website that can potentially reach millions. Goodness me, we've come a long way from some priest keeping a Bible in the back room away from the public. That Gutenberg revolution changed the world. It is my thinking we have a third thing going on. So first, the priests, knowledge is power. When the Gutenberg press became fully used and people began to be educated, wisdom became power. It was those who could interpret the information that came to us on a daily basis. Knowledge is power, we didn't have access to it at all. Wisdom is power, at that time, we had mass availability. We've since then had another revolution, which I think is as big as the Gutenberg revolution. <clears throat> and I'm not alone in this. I think Jordan Peterson thinks the same thing. And that is podcasts. Podcasts are a Gutenberg revolution. They free people to be able to listen to things they never would have normally listened to. <coughs> and enabled them to engage with stuff that they never normally engage with. And increase their knowledge at an extraordinary rate. So the priestly class with their Bibles and their writings, knowledge is power. Mass availability, wisdom is power, the ability to interpret and therefore be able to pass on that knowledge that we had from the Gutenberg Revolution. We then have a new revolution with podcasts, in which case it's no longer knowledge is power and it certainly isn't wisdom is power, it's now curiosity is power. That's the new way. Mm. And that third way is called hutagogy. So we had pedagogy, we had andragogy, we now have hutagogy, which is where we all become teachers and we all become students. Where your primary aim is to teach yourself to teach others. And that is how we get out of this mess. Subsequently, I was contacted by someone in Israel who ran a website that um, monitored the number of gender clinics that had opened across the USA and who worked with um, lots of parents from across the world who have been affected by queer theory and gender ideology, many of whom who had lost children to, to this particular way of thinking. And she asked me if I thought there was any way that we could do something to help the parents, and I wrote a programme, which is a 12-month programme, called The Winning Mindset for Warrior Teachers, which is where we create warrior teachers, which is where we teach people to be able to understand not just what's going on, but how we got here to look at different theories and practices that can enable, can enable them to look at it in different ways. And I'm pleased to say that one of the parents that was originally on the course of one of the first nine, she got her, talk, her daughter desisted from transitioning and she puts it directly down to the fact she was doing the course. To the people that she was doing it with, it's done online. 
and to the people that she met and the ideas that she was given and discussed with her daughter. So part of this solution is recognizing that we as individuals have to take on the mantle of teachers, even if we are not, by dint of career, a teacher, or by dint of character, a teacher, that actually we must learn to teach. And I think that that is a partial solution because in teaching, I work on the principle of not six degrees of separation with this critical social justice business. I work on the principle of what's called 31155, which is an old theory from years ago. And what we do is we get people who are warrior teachers, they talk to a few people each month. And if they can convince three people that when it comes to all of this, the critical social justice, all of it, if they can convince three people that they bought a load of bullshit, which is what it is, those three people will talk to 11 who will talk to 55. That's how we end it. That's what will bring about change. Because what we are, what we are seeing is a top-down imposition. And the only thing that ever, ever overturned a top-down imposition was a bottom-up agitation. Become warrior teachers. The only way forward. Questions, right, who's, who's, folks? Who's got some questions for our, our very <laughs> well, you what, it's, what do you think the end game of critical social justice is? Because if you look at things like anarchy or anarchism, and they've got a definite picture of the structure they want to impose once they've destroyed the old one, but I haven't actually seen anything, any sort of end game with critical social justice. Well, I was asked this question earlier, before, we, before just after we broke. The end, the end game is a utopian idea of equality and inclusivity, where everybody is equal, everybody is included, nobody upsets anybody else, hence things like safe spaces and microaggressions. It's all about trying to control the human nature. Right. It's a deeply anti-human concept, and what they want is a kind of utopia that will never exist, and that's driven every atrocity in humanity. Yeah, but there's no sort of financial, there's, there's no sort of... A Taking account of the economy or anything? No, they don't care. So they don't care. Doesn't it doesn't come into their radar. They don't care. Everything is doable. And exactly, uh, yeah? yeah. There is no, There is. It's just we're going to just disrupt until we destroyed it. Mm. Alexander, uh, you mentioned there's hundreds of organisations that are pushing for this agenda for critical race theory, gender ideology. I'm organising a protest on the seventh of December at McDonald's. Hotel against a company called Culture Shift that's yeah. secured 1.3 million pounds in funding. Their reporting system that's already been rolled out across Manchester University. It's spreading across lots of organisations. Barry and I have just this privately, and the it is a total erasure of biological sex. Now, this includes children using this reporting system if they've been harassed or bullied in a workplace because employers will employ people under 18. Um, no recording biological sex, whatever. Then used for reporting mechanisms to, as a protected characteristic of sex instead of uh, using the dead instead of a sex. And it's everything you were saying. It's uh, the Stasi. I mean, it's, 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 the, it's, it's an electronic Stasi. That's what they are. Right? They're, it's an electronic Stasi. So, what they're doing is they're, they're producing a database of reports which will name individuals and they will keep those names. We know where this goes. Right, that's what they're doing and they're doing it with public funding. They've been I've given the money. One quick bit into that if these reporting systems are completely anonymous which allows for witch hunts. So yeah. by uh, Twitter rules in the workplace, you have an LGBT club, they think such as, <coughs> they've got a term for Twitter or such as, it's just got something about Black Lives Matter. Let's all go up on them, let's report them anonymously. The boss can see this, they can't see the names of who's done report. Really encouraging you to come along. I'll be making more noise better. I mean, it's, can it's kangaroo court time. Yeah, I'll give it for a call. Yeah, um, I completely agree with you. I totally agree with you in terms of the uh, the um, not pedagogy. What was the word? Hutagogy. <laughs> yeah. Right. You know that. I mean, that that sort of thing has got to be organised. Right. Well, I am attempting. Right. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm just saying, <laughs> we've needs started. Be, needs to be organised. Right? I mean, yeah, I think this is a good thing. For example, mm. you know, I mean, organised in terms of arming people. But my question is this: You see, given that the government, right, all of big business, more or less, right, the entertainment industry, right, the colleges, 
every institution of society, the church even, right? Every institution of institution of society, right, is taking this on board, uh -huh. right? I think it's one thing to raise awareness. That's one part of the equation, right? But there needs to be an alternative. That's the thing. Yes. A political alternative. Well, that 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 is something that will be organically grown. You can't because it's not a political. No, I'm just saying but that needs to be. I mean, no, no, I'm, you're right. Right, okay. It's, I would say that's something that needs to be grown organically because most of the fight is not taking place in politics; it's taking place in culture. And culture is extra upstream of politics. So, for example, yes, there are people within organisations, and there are organisations that are doing this. But you've got to understand the mentality of what's going on. You're talking about, say, an MD is running a company with 150,000 staff. Right, they've got an HR department that they trust and an HR manager they probably see once every two years, if they're lucky. Right? What you're talking about is a particular, a particular type of individual who was produced by the university system who is putting this stuff in place. Now, lawfare will deal with some of this because they'll get taken to court. Right? So if I, if I was in an office now, if I was working in an office now and somebody had programs in their email, I would, I would sue them for creating a harassing environment as a homosexual because it automatically means I don't exist because it's fealty to an idea, right? So I do that. I'm yet to see the best HR letter, although I probably should write it myself, saying we've got a bloke practicing a fetish in our office and I want you to stop him. That's what needs to be done. And those cases need to get to court. And I think that lawfare will take part of it. Governments will go where the people go, right? And they're beginning to realize that this does not have the support of the 80% of people who are not involved in the scrap. The entertainment industry will go where the money goes. So, for example, if you watch anything for the last few years, it's, most of it's woke nonsense. I mean, you all have seen these films where it's all woke and, you know, well, watch everything everywhere all at once because that's a game changer. Has anybody seen it? Yeah. That's a game changer. Now, right, the, the queer theorists, they all came out the closet going, it's the best queer film ever made. I've never seen a film like It completely trounces heteronormativity. You know, all the usual performative bullshit that they spout. Um, and it did nothing of the sort. In fact, if you pause it at the beginning, as you go into the mirror in the kind of going through the looking glass Alice in Wonderland type thing that's going to happen to you, because it's an extraordinary ride, isn't it, as a film. If you pause it, you can see that there's some books on the left-hand side that have got their titles obscured. Right? And if you look at the words that are left on the books with the titles obscured, it says an appreciation of non-traditional families. It's not queer at all. At all. It's about the relationship between a mother and her daughter. They completely misread it when you'd expect them to because they can't see outside their ideology. So you can see, and this is the kind of thing that we do in the Warrior Teacher Programme is teach people to recognise where it is happening. There's a great film coming out shortly with, oh, what's her name? Played Galadriel. Who said that? Geek, right? <laughs> Kate Blanchett, right? Yeah. She plays Tar. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Who, who was a composer. Yeah. Right, I'm not a composer, I'm a conductor. There's a great scene in that where she absolutely reams this snowflake to pieces. Absolutely. Now, she, I think they may posit her the villain. I've not seen it yet, but I can't wait because I want to see how they pictured it. Well, that wouldn't have even been in a film two years ago. Right? They'll go where the money goes. Disney has lost the plot. They've lost billions because they can't stop being woke. Right? So, you know, people are waking up now and they're getting rid of the wokesters. Look at what's happened in Twitter. Look at what happened with with uh, Coinbase. Coinbase said you can go and I'll pay you a year's salary to go. And he got rid of them all. Got 5% of his staff went out of 3,000. And he spent a fortune getting rid of them, but he reckons he saved a fortune by not having them in the business because they get in the way. You know, businesses are there to make money. They're not there to sit and talk about how painful life is, you know, or about how difficult things are for you. So I think that you're right to say that it, it seems like a massive thing that's to be done, but I would say that it's promising to me now. It's promising what is happening. I'm here with you. I've got 20 warrior teachers now who are, who are currently going through the programme, nine of whom will finish in March. The others are currently stuck, just had two lots start in the last month or two. And we've got another cohort starting in December. Right. And these people come to me every month with stories about how they're winning. That's how you do it. Is this right? all teachers? No, they're just the mums, most of them. I've got one guy from Romania who's fascinating because he knows about what happened in Romania. So interesting point, sort of bringing in that mums are the majority of your warrior teachers. So I think to have a proper solution to an issue that they're saying for both people, for example, mm. is to look at the root cause. So what do you think that is? Do you think it's a lack of belonging, which is then stemmed from being low, which is then for potentially parenthood? What, what is your... Do you, do you mean the root of, of wokeism? 
Yes. Well, I mean, the idea of woke wasn't a bad idea, right? But there was a philosopher called Kierkegaard, and Kierkegaard said, all the best ideas come from the minority, and the minute they're taken on by the majority, they become absolute nonsense. And he was right, right? It's, you know, it starts off small, it's good, but like everything, every human endeavor, when we all come together to do something, the bigger it gets, the more it tilts towards corruption. Doesn't matter whether it's an idea or whether it's an organization, they tilt towards corruption. So this idea of the woke as we see them today is an absolute bastardization of the original idea of being woke, which was aware of the very real racism in the legal system in America. But do you think parenthood is a contributing factor to it? I, th I think that technology has sidelined parents like it sidelined my generation. And we had no concept of what was coming. And I think that I couldn't lay the blame firmly or squarely at anybody's door because I, would I mean, I've been, I'm a geek, I'm a bit of a techie. <laughs> so I want it, I know, I want all the stuff and I want it now. I've always been like that. I've been on the internet over 30 years and I didn't see it coming. Kiju God also said to name me is to negate me. And what these workers do is reduce the full individual person to their protected character. That's right, that's what it's they do. Gay. Yeah, yeah, it's a gay, yeah. Um, I don't know how, how true this might be, but I'm just going to put it out there, that I think thought in a new right is hostile to women, and it's misogynistic, and a lot of casual misogyny, and a lot of different, you know, like vloggers and channels and YouTubers mm. and like, will have ca casual misogyny which um, I feel very, as a woman who does not subscribe to the majority, find quite difficult, difficult to fill in a leadership role in terms of being also a, a thought leader in that way. Um, what are men doing to make women feel more included as leaders, not as followers, again, of the male holding the Latin textbook, saying this is what you should believe in the religious thing, and the new atheist came out, a bunch of men saying, you're stupid for now believing yeah. that, led by men. <laughs> And instead, you've got Stonewall with some gay men coming along. We're going to go, this is what you're now going to believe regarding that. And now with the backlash that Stonewall is again led by mostly men again. No, Stonewall is led, led completely by women. You think so? No, no, I do know. I know so. It's led, all the men left. Oh, well, well the, the men are, okay, the men are when, gone. When, Ru when, Ruth, when, when Ruth Hunt took over, okay. when Ruth Hunt took over and she brought transgender ideology into Stonewall, okay. that's where the rot set in. Okay. Now, I would, I would agree okay. with, right, so, All right. now, this, this entire plan, yeah. this entire nonsense about transhumanism has come from men, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Its proliferation is the domain of women. Women, yes. <laughs> so, uh, and it's, you know, it's why, why they do, it's HR yeah. departments, yeah. It's, you know, and it's all the places you, now, the reason for that is the original capture yeah. of women's studies. Mm -hmm in the 60s and 70s, once the 80s it began properly, once they captured women's studies and they, and they had their template of grievance and power, they could then place it over everything else. And they went to the female dominated disciplines yeah. first because they knew that STEM was the crown jewel. They've, now, right. they've now got STEM, yeah. right? They've now That's got right. STEM. That's right. So they're interfering now in engineering, yeah. right? Yeah. Imagine that at PhD level in nuclear, for example. Mm -hmm. Right, where they're going to go, no, actually, you haven't got enough women, you better take this woman. Yeah, but how good is she? That doesn't matter. But I'm, I'm, just, take it, yeah. I'm just wondering, why do you think is the reason there's a lack of women leaders in the backlash? In terms of, like, me looking... I don't think there is. I think most of, the, most, of the women, most of the people that I know who I see as leaders and who I interact with are all women. This started with women. I mean, you're here and you're a man, and we've yeah, talked yeah. about Calvin Robinson coming, he's a man. Yeah, yeah. And they're talking about specifically education, about women who are teachers and things like that. Mm. I don't see enough women coming up to talk against it. And I'm just wondering why that is. Well, I, th I would say that the, the backlash against women is far greater than the backlash against men. Yeah, that's what Because right. there's the misogyny. Yeah. Right, you've got to remember that queer theory and, yeah. and, and gender ideology are deeply misogynistic. <laughs> yeah, right? that, that's back to my original point. Which is right, which well, are we going to support women more in terms of protecting them from backlash because we are getting it more from it? Well, you, yeah, that's the idea, yeah. right? But uh, in order to do that, you've got to get the men off the bench. Right, and that's hard to do. So, right, for example, I, so I ran my course, first course, all women, yeah. right? Some amazing women from Sweden, Canada, Israel, America, all over America. Mm -hmm. And then I did the second course, and it's all women, right? All these women have come along to learn. Did the third one, one man. Done the fourth one, two men, mm -hmm. right? Now, the point is that men are, I don't know why, but it, it's not, if you're, if you're a bloke, right? Like a woman, a woman I know, her friend went to see her dad, and her dad's a Yorkshireman, right? And Yorkshiremen are particularly good at being 
I'm all right, love, just get on with it. You know, they're very laid back people generally. And his her father is very much like that, right? And he was sat at the dinner table with her having, having dinner and they'd all gone over for the Sunday like you normally would. Yeah. And everybody else got up and started to go to do various things. And, you know, and his wife went to wash the dishes and his, his daughter was sat with him quietly, not saying anything. And he was reading the paper. And he looked above his paper and made sure that everybody was else, else was out of the room. And then he put his hand on her arm and he said to her, keep my grandchildren out of Primark. And the paper went back up. That was it, right? So there's something about men don't get off the bed, get off the bench as quickly as women because their organising principles aren't as astute. Women have astute organisation principles that men don't. But when men get off the bench, the game's over, right? So we're almost waiting for the men to because what we're dealing with here is other men, right? If in some, in most cases, that many of the people that are pushing this are men. Right, so what we're dealing with is other men. Now that's when we're talking about, and if you want to think about it this way, that at the heart of this, you've got what I call the spiders, right? Or the high priests. Mm -hmm. Judith Butler, Pat Khalifa, Gail Rubin. All women, strange enough, mm -hmm. right? Who, who ran with this idea of transhumanism, which came from Fitzger and all the other people that have been writing about it for 50 years. Then you've got the people that they taught, who then taught the people that came next. That's the bunch we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, those, what I would call high priests, then train their own acolytes mm -hmm. who are believers. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful scene in The Omen. Do you remember the film? I just don't remember, yeah. you're very young. But do you remember the film? There's a great scene with Billy Whitlaw, who's bloody terrifying. A, do you remember when she's taking her jacket off in the hospital? And all of a sudden she stood there, this sort of nanny like figure, yeah. um, where, she said, where, where the priest says to her, she will kill for the child because she is an acolyte. Right? These people are acolytes, they'll die for the cause. Yeah. Well, that's not who's causing most of the problems. Most of the problems are being called not by the acolytes, mm -hmm. but by the adherents mm -hmm. who don't believe it, but want to do it because they are narcissistic mm -hmm. pricks. <laughs> <laughs> I said that without moving my mouth. <laughs> uh, yeah, they, well, because, they are, they are, because it's about narcissistic compassion. It's this belief that they're good people. So it's the adherents that most people will come across mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Now, I know, for example, in the university that I was teaching at, that there's a spider in the middle of it. Mm. But the minute that they got wind that I might be in the room, they won't come. Because <laughs> they don't want to be challenged, right? Now, mm. Judith Butler sat down with Owen Jones in November of last year and blatantly said, on his, on his interview, yeah. that they are about breaking down the barrier between adulthood and childhood. They blatantly said it. Now, it's very easy, we were having this conversation yeah. outside, to think yeah. about, well, what they mean is they want sex with children. That's not what they mean. What they mean is that the concept of childhood yeah. is preventing the onset of the utopia. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that a lot. Okay, that's what they mean. Does that answer? It was a bit of a convoluted <laughs> way of saying, yes, misogyny exists and we'll deal with it. I, it's, it's, let's do this first and then we'll go back to dealing with that. It's like okay. it's a big threat to all of us, you know? Anybody else? So what is the utopia? What is the goal? Then? Uh, well, what they see as equality. Yeah, but what, right? what is this? What, 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 yeah, but equality of outcome, yeah. not equality of opportunity. So everybody gets the same. Communism. Right, call it communism if you will. <laughs> but not only that, you've also got the queer theorists in there whose only reasoning Conversion. is to break down what they see as heteronormative society, <clears throat> which is everything we've had since the Enlightenment. Anarchy meets communism. Left meets right. And it's, you know, when you get horseshoe theory, they're up here. And myself, as a classic liberal, is here. They are in direct opposition to everything that I believe. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. So, and I've, I've, we've talked about this before, and I've talked about this before, because I teach, and I'm in, surrounded by all of this nonsense and, and everything. But it's so insidious, and it has, it has covered... I mean, if you don't know what your children and your grandchildren are doing in school, shame on you. Because I promise you, they are getting bombarded with this stuff. And by the time you figure it out, it'll be too late and they will turn on you. They'll say, oh dad, you're, you're, you're Stone Age. You're, you're a hater, you're this, you're that. You're all of this kind of stuff. And it is insidious. And these teachers, I, I was surrounded and most of them were women, and they totally sucked up to it. But it's, Han it's Hanlon's razor, right? It's Hanlon's razor, which is don't put down to wickedness that you can ascribe to stupidity. Man at the back. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, um, I've just, um, I was listening very carefully to what you were saying uh, uh, early on. And I know the conversation has moved on a little bit, but I would like to get back to one of the um, uh, examples you were given about uh, children being taught at school, about, uh -huh. um, you know, circling different uh, sexual positions. Here. Yeah. Ma uh, and uh, you were, I clearly could see that you were communicating some kind of a message there, but uh, I just probably didn't get it. Yeah. So I just want to clarify a few things here. Okay, far away. So you, you were saying that uh, children are taught at the age of uh, 12 about uh, sex, more yeah. or less. So it's, like it's, sort of, it's a quite early uh, topic to discuss. Yeah. But as far as I understand, uh, the majority of sexual relationship between teenagers happens around that time. So my question is, when do you want to have this conversation with children? I want to have the conversation when they're 12. Okay. Right? But I don't want to have a conversation driven by an ideological premise that everything's about power and oppression. Right, so it's not so. So they put up on the board. This is what we're going to learn. But actually, you've got to learn to read what's behind it. Uh, Barry, um, first of all, this has possibly been the most depressing sort of. <laughs> <laughs> not because of what you've been saying, because your, your delivery has been fantastic. But it's just scary what mm. the hell's happening, uh, and and it's true. And um, it's not the age of it, it's twelve. It's at least ten and under now. Yeah, as you um, said. And, yeah. And, and so when you're talking about sort of twelve-year-olds. But that's, you're not even scraping the surface now. Um, it's, it's well below that. So, for example, my 10-year-old daughter, so far as I'm concerned, doesn't need to know, <laughs> isn't it terrible to even bloody say it, that she'll become a little bit sort of aroused, sort of sexually, you know, um, when she sees a, a chap. She's 10 years old. She doesn't need to know that sort of level of detail. You know, it, it's wrong at every level. And uh, I'll just read you this email because I, I received this from my school on Friday. Um, you know, in their all-knowing world, the England football team are playing in Iran in the World Cup in Qatar uh, tomorrow. Um, we are also, so this is actual school email, we are also aware that the decision for Qatar to host the tournament has been criticised. In an age-appropriate way, we will be discussing this with the children in the assemblies and PSHE lessons next week. There you go, that's it, it's the political, they, it's the... They oh. do not need to bloody know no, they don't. any of that. No, they don't. You know, they're, 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 that's for the parents to talk about, well, why, you know, why is Qatar controversial? That is no, you know, from my perspective... But, 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 that, but that, that's the agenda in action. Yeah, that's the that, LGBTQI plus you know, hands, knees and bumps, daisy people. You know, so apologies, Barry, I'm not saying... It's, you know, the topic is depressing rather than you. Well, the, well I, I mean, the topic is depressing, and I hope that, you know... Sorry, that, you know, it, 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 it's, I, under, I, under, I understand that it's depressing, and it's really strange, because I've been in this scrap now for a few years, and I talk to people that have also been in the scrap for a few years, Nick being one of them, and what you go through once the realisation hits properly is horrible. Because everything that I held dear is now under attack. Absolutely. And my biggest fear is, I will die before I stop it. That's my biggest fear, that's all I care about now. And I've lost you know, friends out of this, Nick knows I've lost friends and I've lost jobs and I can't get any work and I'm now trying to build up this, this, this warrior teacher thing so that I can, I've got something to do, so I can make some money, but also to help other people. And it's, it's the most extraordinary displacement of where you are. And it's not like it's change that has come gradually, it's whack. It's like you've been living in a bubble. That's what they're up to. Right. And this is happening for numerous, very complicated reasons. And it's happening and proliferating for numerous and very complicated reasons. But you have to understand that anywhere they can lay the template, they will lay it. OK, so that's why we've got people doing degrees and writing PhDs and, and, and dissertations in the gendering of icebergs. Right, or the, ge or the or the or the queering of drones on the warfield, or or the degendering German nouns. De de that's right, yeah, degendering. You know, that's the kind of it is. Sorry, it is every single lesson, and it's you know, um, I, I got another one, citizenship in particular. Oh yeah, that's another lesson which is absolutely disgusting in terms of brainwashing. Yeah. So it, you know, it's just like this. This is this is the this is the collapse of the liberal idea of yeah. education into a far left hellhole. Yeah, I've got a photo of the book actually, because yeah. trusted websites are the BBC, <laughs> the, yeah. Guardian, the Guardian, and the International. Uh, for, and Mermaids, I imagine, oh, if you look oh, hard enough. Yeah. Well, you know what I mean, but it, it's off the scale, that there's no look, you know, look across the spectrum of no. news, and then no, 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 if you read the no. spectrum, you, you might find the truth somewhere. Yeah. It's just BBC, I mean, the Guardian, and the International, happy days. I'm, I'm going to hold on to what, hold on to what you've just said, because Nick wants to ask a question just one sec, yeah? Nick. Mine's more of a statement to depress everybody even further. Um, 
we're here because of one simple reason, and that's because of us. Us as in this room, us as in society, because we've allowed this to happen. And we didn't allow this to happen over the last five years or ten years. This has been happening for something like a hundred years. But all that's happened now for the people in this room is it's happened to hit something you disagree with. But this has been going on for a long time. It's been a long time since we've started breaking down gender roles. It's been a long time since we've started under the screams of feminism that we've removed all male spaces. And no one complained then because of shouts of equality. This has been a long road. We've just got to a stage now where we in this room think this bit's crazy. But the people supporting this are still on this journey. They just don't think this bit's crazy yet. But some of them, next year when it goes a little step too far, will then go, oh, now it's gone too crazy. People 30 years ago were saying this was crazy 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't crazy for us because we hadn't hit that point yet. Yeah. This goes back a long, long way. I'm not saying it's right, I'm not saying it's wrong. But this isn't new, the way we're tearing society apart now and tearing down historic roles, traditions and what we are as people, society, men and women. It's not new. It isn't new. I think Nick makes a very good point and, and I think it's worth, note, worth, worth noting this is that you know, for a long time after, I mean, I'd left school by the point this started, I think it started about 1980-81, it was this, this strange mantra, all learning's in the learner. And it was all about the whole kid, and it was, you know, it was all about it's in there. Well, when they discovered it wasn't in there, they started putting it in. Mm. Right? So, so they did, they were no longer going to the kid, right, write this out 50 times, you'll remember it. Because that's all you needed the kids to do for a certain amount of time when they um, they were doing the whole, it's all in the, now if you just try harder, you'll understand it. It was all about in the, the it's in learning's in the learner. And this focus on an inner journey, which they've now turned into an inner journey to discover whether or not you're going round the bend. Well, that's been that's been made far worse by by um, technology. What what young people, not all of them, but what some young people are now doing is creating what I call the, a digital flesh vessel. Right? It's an avatar that replaces their body online. Right, and they're hiding away behind that. So they put up a picture or an image. They put up this front that it goes out into the into the into the into cyberspace. And not only that, they betray their fast their their, their past future selves. And by, so they take photographs, they'll alter it. And they'll stick it on. They'll alter it and stick it on. And eventually, that'll come to the point where they look back in fifteen years' time and go, "That's not me." And they won't have a picture of what they were like. Mm. Right? It's the betrayal of a future past self. In addition to doing that. They're doing that by staring inward. They're being told that it's all about your emotions and it's all about oh, your, your well-being, which is well-being's code for I'm going to interfere in your life, right? Well-being is code for that. And so they've got to look in. It's all about how they feel, right? That's got to stop, okay? I was, I was writing something for the Warrior Teacher Programme yesterday and I was, we were looking at the history of telephony and the history of digital and how we got to where we are today. And both the telephone and the ability to transfer information across it, were born of adversity. They weren't born of safety. This constant safetyism, this idea that actually people need to be protected from it, is a, a disaster. And that's come straight out of the liberal education system. It's gone wrong, badly. And we need to recognise it's gone wrong. We need people in power who can do something about it. But this is small fry, folks. You know, 5% of the people that are on Twitter are from the UK. And only 5% of the people that are on Twitter from the UK use Twitter at all, for example. The stuff that we're talking about is currently in very small enclaves that understand what's going on. That's why I've managed to attract people from Romania, from, because we're all coming together and going, what the hell's going on? And we know that it's a grassroots movement because people are coming together who know the situation and have never spoken to each other before. It's a collaborative endeavor, whereas what we're fighting is a collectivist idea. And we'll win. You have a question over here, Eric. Oh, hello there, yes. Hi. Um, you may have answered this already. <laughs> it's possible. But you know, we've, we've had 12 years of a Conservative government, mm -hmm. and this has creeped through onto that watch. Yeah. And we're now likely to, in the next election, have a Labour government. Don't you think that's going to make the problem worse? Far but, worse. Yeah. In, in ways you cannot imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Far worse. Yeah. Um, yes, um, 
Oh, I actually want to disagree with Nick, and I really admire Nick. I sort of um, followed you on Twitter from, from when you were cancelled. Um, but I don't, I don't, I think things like legalisation of homosexuality, um, challenging some of the gender stereotypes, not necessarily gender roles, um, are all, were actually good things. I, 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 I think um, they, sh I'm very glad they happened. You know, people may disagree, that's fine. I think this is different. I, I think the ideal, the gender ideology stuff is has has sort of um, been championed by Stonewall, who had done a very, very, very good job with um, homosexuality in particular, um, and had done such a good job that they then had to look around for something else oh, to do, mm -hmm. and they had then they had developed the, the skills um, to, to, through the through the, 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 uh, their battle to um, get rights for, for, for gay people um, so well that they have been behind the scenes using them on this issue, on gender ideology. And I think it's been, it's a really, back, that is a backward thing. Well, I think you raise a very interesting point, and if I can just address that one point to begin with before, if you want to add anything else. Um, Stonewall was formed because of, <clears throat> who knows? The violence, the violence. Stonewall violence. No. See, everybody says that. It's got nothing to do with America. No. Why was Stonewall formed? To campaign for same-sex equality no. for rights against yeah. Section 28. Right, against Section 28. Now, I hear this all the time. Stonewall were formed to fight against Section 28. But at the same time as Stonewall formed, we also had things like ACT UP, where people would out politicians that were lying about their sexuality. So there was all sorts going on. What people forget is why Section 28 came into being. Sorry, no, I don't know what Section 28 is. Well, I'll just give you a rundown, right? <laughs> Section 28 made it a crime, made it a crime for any teacher to promote homosexuality. And local councils. And local councils, it was that kind of thing, right? And Section 28 came in and, oh, there was outrage. Outrage from the gay community. Oh, it's a terrible thing. From certain elements of the gay community. There were other elements of the gay community that were glad it was there. Because they'd spent the previous 10 years trying to remove the tendrils of an organisation called PI, which was the paedophile information exchange, who had attached themselves to the gay movement. Section 28 was a direct result of the activities of PI. Mm -hmm. Right? Now, the reason that I say that, or well, I tell this story, is because people go, oh, it was the Tories. It was no. At that point, you think about when that was passed, AIDS was in full flow, stories about you know, what, what Pi had been up to with children and what they were putting into schools. And there was some of it that would have been far too progressive. It wouldn't look like it now, but then it certainly was. And you were in a situation where if the Tories had told the British public they were going to recriminalise homosexuality, they would have done it. They'd have done it in a second and they'd have got away with it. But they didn't. And this is the bit what people always forget. They put in Section 28, right? And when they put in Section 28, it stopped the promotion by councils and teachers. It was aimed at a particular council, truth be told, by, by councils and teachers. They put that in, and it was never, ever used. Nobody was ever prosecuted. There was never any attempt to prosecute anyone. Mm -hmm. The myths yeah. around it are nonsense. Nobody ever emptied libraries. Nobody ever did any of that. It's rubbish, yeah. right? The reason that Section 28 existed was because it was the only way that Thatcher could keep the right of the party happy. And the right of the party wanted to recriminalise it. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to remember, it was not the left that gave us our decriminalisation. It was the right mm -hmm. that gave it to us. Winston Churchill started when he said that they were going to have the Wolfenden Report, which would examine the fact that gay people were being blackmailed mm -hmm. because they were gay and it was illegal. He didn't do it because he thought that being gay was a good idea. I imagine he was a homophobe. He did it because to him it wasn't fair. It was not fair that people in this country should be treated in such a way by the state. And 10 years after the Wolfenden Report was written, they decriminalised homosexuality. And Margaret Thatcher voted for it, and Harold Wilson voted against it. The left had nothing to do with the decriminalisation of homosexuality. Nothing. Until it became a cause that they could jump on. Most people don't even know that. Enoch Powell was pro for decriminalisation of homosexuality and led to the and he's remembered for the controversial words of blood, but uh, were definitely people on the right. I mean, Leo Abs, the Liberal, was far more, and Roy, Roy Jenkins helped from Labour. Yeah. You know, it ended up being a cross-party thing that went through, and it went through by the skin of its teeth. 
but it went through because it was started because that Churchill said I'm not having it I'm not having people treated this way there was, a, there was a film released in 1957 which I haven't seen, if you haven't seen it it's on BBC iPlayer called Victim starring Dirk Bogart mm. and that changed the public's mind there was public support for Section 28 across both sides as well from Labour's side who country called for it so politicians were ultimately doing delivering on a mandate on what the public called them to do so you're on Okay, well just um, <laughs> politics, okay, I just moved from France, now it was the Labour government that brought in, that legalised gay marriage, okay, I'm finding this political... In France? Yeah, it was oh. a Labour government, it was Holland who legalised... <laughs> socialist. Uh, socialist, Labour, yeah. yeah, socialist, Labour, left wing, who legalised mm. gay marriage in France. But I'm, I'm a socialist, I'm, an, I'm on the left, and I, I find the political aspects of this slightly disturbing. Mm. You talk about neo-Marxism. I don't really know exactly what you meant, what you mean. Also, you talked about communism, but I think it's a shame to sort of make it right wing, because I completely agree with what we're saying, but I think I can be a socialist as well. No, no, of course, but I'm not saying right. Know, but no, why I... is it considered to be, obviously, neo-Marxism, that's left wing. Why is believing what we, we're talking about, why is it considered to be right wing rather than the left wing? Right, okay. Let's 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 try and try and give us some context around this one. I would say I would say the following, right? Okay, the system that they are using to get this into society is a left-wing system. Now, years ago, socialists and Marxists would have said, right, okay, let's talk about class differences. Let's talk about the material analysis of what's going on. And when we did, we ended up with the NHS. When we did, we ended up with social security. When we, so you know, we cuckoo. Let's have the best bits of this, right? But nevertheless, what they've done is they've taken that Marxist idea of the working class and the you know everything else that comes with it, and they've just changed it for race, sexuality, gender, sex, whatever they choose, in order to use it so they can do their intersectionality, right? That's what they do. Now, so what you've got is a left-wing project that the, that the capitalist market in America has seen to be a big money spinner. So you've got, this is horseshoe theory in action. So you've gone round from the middle like that, and you've got the right, hard right capitalists meeting the hard left neo-Marxists and finding a perfect symmetry in the fact that if we can dis destabilize sex and make people believe that they can be the other sex, that is a medical market that can be exploited to the tune of billions and billions of pounds, right? And the only thing that stopped that from happening in the UK is because we have socialized medicine. You want to get your head around all that? Because it's insane. And the reason it's insane is because it's cultural and it's not political. And the fact that we have political parties is starting to feel to me really anachronistic. It feels out of time. There's something not right. There's something massive changing about how we do politics. So I would say that what we're seeing is a joining of left and right in a way that we've <coughs> never seen before to create a new entity that we probably aren't even capable of naming yet. So it really is the emergence of the political zeitgeist right now, I think, is fascinating. And I would say that I don't, cap I don't characterise it as either right, right wing or left wing. I just characterise it as wrong. It's just morally wrong. So it's wrong from a human point so of view. why do you call it neo-Marxism? I only call it neo-Marxism because it's, it's the skeletal structure that they've used of Marxism. And I call it the new Marxism because they've just done the same things as Marxists did. <laughs> but they've done it in you mean, a... You mean in aiming a for equality, you mean? No, well, well Marxism aimed for equity, no. not See, I, equality. I discovered that word when I moved back to this country. Right, OK. I didn't, so, I didn't even know what it meant. Right, so <laughs> you know, that, yeah. that's the danger. Is that Marx, Marxism was about, right, let's make sure everybody can get a fair crack of the whip, mm -hmm. right? Well, that went too far, didn't it? You ended up in a situation where let's make sure everybody has got it. In order to do that, we're going to take that from him and give it to them. It's the story about the kids in the class. Have you ever heard it? That figure, or did I say it earlier? Yeah. Yeah, the kids in the class, yeah? So it, that, that was where it went wrong. And it's like everything else. If you don't put the brakes on, it goes wrong. One of the biggest problems that we've got with this is we're incredibly good at recognising when the right goes wrong because we've got historical yeah. records and we've yeah. seen the horror of what happens with the far right. We're not so good at seeing what, what, what goes wrong with the left yeah. because the story of the Holodomor, which happened in the Ukraine, has never been told as well as the story of the Holocaust, which happened obviously in Europe. And the reason that that's never been told as well is a, is a real problem for our society, because that killed far more people than the Holocaust did, far more. 
And it was a far more destructive and pervasive force. So that's why, for example, I, I can go into a university and I'll see a kid wearing a, wearing a communist, you know, communist T-shirt or a Che Guevara hat or whatever. But you wouldn't accept that if they went in wearing a Nazi flag. You wouldn't do it, right? So we seem to have this inability to recognise when the left has gone too far, but we recognise very clearly when the right has gone too far. And I'm thinking that what... So we have a situation now where if they're calling for equity, if they're calling for equity, they are going to take it from somebody else to give it to somebody else. That's where totalitarianism starts. So it's very hard. How does this fit politically in that sort of map of meaning we have of politics over the last 80 or 90 years? It doesn't easily fit. And it doesn't easily fit because we live in, live in an era of disruption, which is called punctuated equilibrium. Who knows about punctuated equilibrium? Just before I ask some more questions. It's more of a sort of bioevolutionary concept. It is. It's a bio, it's a, <coughs> I stole it from biology. Right. Well, why the hell not? But it's a, bri it's a brilliant concept. This concept that for 80% of the time in evolution, nothing happens, and 20% of the time it goes batshit crazy. <laughs> Well, I think that up until about 1980, we were in the very little atoms, and then suddenly technology has gone whack, in which case we are living the time when everything's up in the air, and therefore all of the old ways of doing things and the old ways of seeing and the old ways of understanding have been drained. They're being thrown around like, like, like so many cotton wool balls in a real good wind. I'm just going to go to somebody who hasn't asked yet. Gentleman there in the yellow. This is a slightly ethereal question, so bear with me. Um, you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting, the idea that this isn't something new, it's been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the reason we're in here today is because it's hit a point that resonates with us. Presumably, therefore, other people have been resonated at different points backwards. So how do I, as an individual, decide whether something on this progress, we might call it, is an actual threat to society, or whether it's just, I don't like it? That's a very interesting question. Um, come and be a warrior teacher. You want the answer to that? Because it's not something I can tell you just like that. It doesn't exist, right? That's about, that's about pattern forming. So uh, we're pattern seeking creatures. And if I'm right about what, we were, what I was just blath blathering about to you, yeah. right, that everything's up in the air, you know, like one of those machines with all the balls, that everything's up in the air and that everything's being thrown around, then the patterns that we normally see are gone. So the important then becomes, well, what pattern have you got? What narrative? How are you anchoring yourself? Because you're going to have to, because they're, they're attempting to, to, to take the big anchor that keeps us all together is, is being attacked. So how do you anchor your narrative? How do you anchor yourself? What do you see that means that actually that's a bad idea? Or what is it they're trying to do there? And you can spot it. If you want to know a simple reason to be, a simple way to spot it, if what they are doing produces an equilibrium that will allow them to point at an oppressor, and to point at the oppressed, it's problematic. That's it, it's a problem. 